Okay guys, I know it's been a while, but the channel is back up and running again, and for the time being, please ignore the blank wall, I'm about to move. Fortunately for this video, you're not going to see too much of it, because I'm going to be up in the corner of the screen. Uh, but in this video, what I want to talk about is Japanese warfare, specifically the lack of shields, or the apparent lack of shields, that we typically think of when we, you know, view samurai in almost anything involving popular culture, so movies, manga, anime, TV, that kind of thing. So to start, what I actually want to have all of you do is look at this print. So this is a copy made in 1854 of a 1620-era print. So like any source, using art has its own problems. To use art properly, you have to know a certain number of things. Who made it? When? Um, you know, was it like officially commissioned? Or was it just like a doodle? Something somebody did on their own time? What does it depict? If it's a military scene, for example, like this one, is the artist, do they have some kind of a military background? Because that's going to affect their understanding, potentially, of military equipment, troop formations, that kind of thing. It just so happens that this particular one is a direct copy of a 1620 print of the Battle of Sekigahara. So the Battle of Sekigahara occurred on October 20th, 1600. It ostensibly unified Japan and brought it out of the Sengoku Jidai, the famed age of the country at war into the Edo period, this era of, uh, you know, peace that was overseen by the Tokugawa shogunate and the emperor, to an extent. But this print is roughly contemporaneous with the battle. We happen to know that there were still plenty of people around who fought at this battle, so if you're going to use it for military history purposes, it's pretty good. But what I'm particularly concerned with here okay, for the purposes of this video, is the apparent lack of shields that these troops are using. Which I suppose begs the question, why no shield? I mean, this is, this is something that shows up across most, if not all, pre-gunpowder era militaries basically across the world. So the Europeans use them, the Chinese use them, Central Asians use them to an extent, Africans use them. People in the Americas use shields. We have evidence of this thing everywhere. And it seems like it'd be a wise kind of logical thing to use, right? It's a barrier, or another barrier anyway, assuming you have armor on, between your opponent's weapon and you. So why does this thing not show up really in Japanese military culture? So if you were to go around and you look at like various, you know, internet forums and other sites online, so Reddit, etc. Um, the common internet answer, and YouTube even, is, well, the samurai fought as horse archers, so why would you use a shield if you're on horseback? And we're going to come back to that one later on in the video. Another one you'll find is that it's dishonorable. It offends the samurai mentality of Bushido. Another one is that it's just, you know, it's, it's purposeless, considering that the samurai fought, or are perceived to have fought, in popular culture, on the battlefield, in duels. A better answer would be really shields do not show up in samurai warfare to a large degree because shields are not needed due to how Japanese armor and warfare develop. So let's start going with this. The first thing we should probably do is talk about the Ritsorio state and its military. So, what is the Ritsorio state? The, I guess, country, the, the nation that we conceive of as Japan, didn't start out as a unified polity, kingdom, nation, whatever word you want to use. The ancient Chinese sources for the Japanese islands basically tell us that, yeah, there was civilization there, uh, but people were organized into a myriad of, use whatever term you want, city-states, semi-autonomous villages, autonomous villages, confederations, kingdoms, that, that kind of thing. Um, eventually, though, Japan gets unified. So this occurs largely during the Yayoi and the Kofun periods. And if you guys aren't familiar with that, I'm not going to go into it here, but I do have a series that's coming out next week on Japanese history from the beginnings right up until modern times. So be sure to check that out. Um, this is a period that is... Well, there are multiple ways we can describe this. The way I want to describe it here is it's very Japanese. It's very insular. In the Asuka, the Nara, and the Heian periods, we start getting more 
continental contact, more contact with mainland East Asia. So this is not only China, but this is Korea. This is, to an extent, the Eastern Steppe. But this is, to an extent, Southeast Asia. So like that area. In order to make the Japanese state strong, the Yamato Kingdom, the Yamato Dynasty, in the Nara and Heian periods, takes Chinese whatever you want to use, you know, Chinese institutions, Chinese customs, whatever, however you want to describe this, and they bring it over and they implement it in the Japanese kingdom, state, polity, thing. Now, it's kind of misunderstood if you read like a pop history book or even a basic textbook that the Ritsorio state, which is what the Yamato kingdom becomes known as once it implements Chinese culture and Chinese governmental structures, it's kind of looked at as being a direct carbon copy of China. Not really. This is more taking Chinese stuff and applying it to the Japanese situation. So you're taking all the good stuff, modifying some others, and you get this new state in Japan, ostensibly based along Chinese lines, along the Chinese model. And in the Ritsurio state, because it's based on the Chinese model, well, one of the things the Chinese have is a conscript military. So this is what we see in Japan at this time. So... Ostensibly, yeah, the Japanese Ritsuryo state military is based on Chinese models, specifically Sui and Tang Dynasty models, so it's a peasant conscript army, it's a national army, to whatever extent you want to use the term national in this period. Um, eventually it's replaced. Why is it replaced? That's the subject of another video, but for the purposes of this one, all I'm going to say is that peasants were largely expected to bring their own equipment. Not all of it, but a good deal of it. So, the Ritsuryo era military is very notable for this, you know, I guess, subject of why don't the Japanese use shields? Because they actually do use shields. The first shield is called a Tedate or a Timochi. This is a handheld shield. Um, it's made of wood. Eventually, it's faced by iron, or to a degree, faced by iron. It's handheld. It's designed to be, you know, wielded alongside spears, axes, swords, all of which we know from archaeology, because this thing shows up all the time. The other kind of shield, which you're going to see on the left, is a tate. Sometimes it's translated as tate with a D. Um, this is much bigger. This is a large shield, more of a barrier, really, that you set up in front of you basically to protect and support missile troops. So the textual sources for this particular time period, the Asuka, the Nara, the early Heian, talk about this thing, the Oyumi. It translates to Great Bow or Big Bow. Um, that's about all we got. No one's really sure what this thing is. The translation to Great Bow implies or suggests that the Oyumi is a kind of ballista, large crossbow kind of thing. Um, the textual sources tell us that when Japanese armies are campaigning in the north of Honshu in 600, in 700, in 800, the Tate are deployed alongside the Oyumi. And the Oyumi are described as making the arrows fall like rain, such that the barbarians, meaning the Imishi, which is the subject of a different video, um, cannot stand against them. So these are basically large barriers designed to support and protect missile troops. But the mass use of shields fall out. Why? That's, that's kind of the key question here, right? The Japanese have this thing, they use it and then it kind of disappears more or less from the Japanese battlefield. So the time period that we're talking about now extends from the Kamakura period, really the late Heian, up into the Edo period. So, I don't know, 1050, 1100, somewhere around there to about 1868 when the Meiji Restoration happens and the Tokuyoma Bakufu collapses. So we've got this big period of about 7, 850 years, where the shield doesn't really show up in warfare. Okay, why is this? In order to answer that question, we probably have to talk about the early samurai. So it's unclear how these guys develop. It's very likely that they are mercenaries. It's also very likely that, to a degree, many of the early samurai arise out of the imishi. Again, these, you know, barbarous peoples. Barbarous, the texts call them barbarians, because they're not Yamato, they're not Japanese, uh, who lived in the north of Honshu. Many of these people, under the Fushu system, were kind of co-opted. They were brought into the Yamato state and resettled throughout Yamato-controlled territory, where they basically acted as local troops and as mercenaries. It's probable that there is some connection to this 
system of bringing these other people, these natural warriors, into the Yamato state. Because the early samurai fight in the same way that the Imishi fought, that is horseback archery. For effective horse archery, at least in Japan, this is not designed to be a universal statement, but at least in Japan, they don't use shields. So, handheld shields, things you would grasp and then use to block a blow, you don't have. Why? Because you have to hold the bow and pull the arrow. A shield could potentially, depending on the size of the bow, get in the way. So, you would, I guess, ostensibly be left defenseless. That's not a good idea. So how do you get around this? And the answer is that you put shields on your shoulders. So what you're looking at here is a suit of oyuroi. So this is one of the original forms of armor that samurai would wear when they kind of transitioned into mass armies of horse archers. What I want to point out here is the stuff on the shoulders, the stuff that would be on the shoulders anyway. These large rectangular blocks of interlaced scale. So these are called sode, and sode are not like, you know, pauldrons or spalders in the European sense that you have something that is connected to everything else, armor-wise, and then kind of wrapped around your shoulder. So it doesn't go all around here tightly. What it does is it's connected through a series of straps, basically this area, where the shoulder meets the neck, and then it's laced into the back on a series of hooks and bows, so that when you shift your arm, the sword it moves along with it, and it protects the vast majority of your arm. So basically what happens with this armor is handheld shields are redesigned, refitted to go onto the shoulder. So, yeah, I mean, if you want to get into semantics, the, this is the Japanese, this is the samurai using shields in their warfare, but that's kind of a cop-out, I want to go a little deeper with this video. The key transition here, as far as Japanese warfare and samurai warfare and the use of shields, all that stuff is concerned, is the late 13th and the early to mid 14th century. So samurai basically go from units of horse archers supported by dismounted infantry to units of lance cavalry, to a degree, supported by dismounted infantry. To a degree, the armor slims down, the sode slim down, uh, so I guess that use of shields on the shoulders kind of dissipates a little bit. The key thing here, though, is right after the 14th century ends, and we go into the 1400s, into the 15th century, there is a succession dispute in the mid-1400s. So in 1467, the Onin War breaks out, and this is a war that basically is focused around the city of Kyoto. Kyoto becomes an absolute freaking war zone. The city is basically burned down, trenches are dug in the streets, the various contenders for power bring in their armies, they bring in their samurai, but it's not enough. Without going into too much detail here, one thing kind of leads to another, and we get the rise of a new kind of soldier, the Ashigaru. These are mass levies of peasant Soldiers, peasant foot troops, dismounted infantry, and these guys are armed with two-handed weapons, pikes, bows, eventually we get firearms um, from the Portuguese, ostensibly, although much of that research has actually changed, and it's now suggesting that, yeah, the Portuguese brought firearms, but they were already familiar with, they being the Japanese, firearms, uh, because the pirates, the Wako, who were active in the Sea of Japan around the Sengoku Jidai already had them. But my point is that we get a new kind of soldier, mass infantry formations all armed with two-handed weapons that basically precludes the use of a shield because you have no other limb with which to grasp the shield. Um, and now we get into this problem of, well, there's Sengoku warfare, Mass pike formations results in a change in the construction of large shields. So we're not using handheld shields anymore, we're now using the large, you know, barricade-type shields that have basically been used since forever. And 
the use of guns destroys large shields, which reinforces this chaotic period of Sengoku warfare, which brings back mass pike formations, which brings back a change in the construction of shields. It's this vicious cycle. Okay, so in this time period, we have this change in shield construction. So what does this look like? And it basically, it looks like this. So what you're looking at here is a depiction of peasant troops armed with matchlocks. And they are blocked by, or protected by, a barricade of shields. So, what's the stuff in front of it? It looks like grass, and the answer is, yeah, this basically, this is, um, wet bamboo and wet grass. So the tate become thicker, by about two to three inches. They become reinforced with iron in this period, because it's believed that this will help stop bullets. And then wet, strong, wet grass is placed in front of the Tate, because this is believed it will slow down the bullets. It also is reinforced with bundles of bamboo. So, you can get rid of the wet grass, the wet hay, the wet whatever, and replace it with bundles of bamboo. It's believed it will do the same thing. So this, is basically, in the Sengoku Jidai, is what you see, really, in terms of shields. Um... So, they're still using this stuff, but where's the handheld shield? It's kind of not here anymore. Well, yeah, ostensibly. That's kind of what it looks like. But we know from plenty of Edo period sources, so 17 and 1800s, and late Sengoku period sources, so late 1500s, little into the 1600s, that handheld shields are still around, but they change. So, rather than being a large shield that you would have on your hand or arm, rather, to protect most of your body, it basically becomes something like a buckler. So what you're looking at is an illustration out of an Edo period um, fighting techniques book. So, as you can see, the Tadate becomes significantly smaller, really the size of a buckler, and unlike earlier shields, it's no longer made exclusively of wood. Some of them now are made exclusively of iron, some of them are made of wood faced with iron, uh, but this is basically what happens to shields. So, I guess if we're going to sum everything up, why do the Japanese begin with large handheld shields, kind of like you'd see anywhere else, and then gradually transition to either this thing, these small buckler kind of shields, or none at all on the battlefield? And the answer basically is, it has to do with how Japanese armor and warfare developed. It developed basically to ignore or basically make obsolete the use of shields, much in the same way that by the time the 1600s roll around, European armor has done the same thing. So, with all of that being said, I'm going to end this video here. If you want more information on this stuff, check the sources I've listed below. They're all available. Until then, I will see you all next time.